We are back and we are joined now by Marco Fonseca, professor of Latin American and International Studies in the Department of International Studies at Glendon College, York University, proprietor of the Refundacion Ya Spanish language substack. Um, Marco, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me back. So uh, we finally have some uh, good news <laughs> to share on the program. And it was yes, a little scary, th scary there for a second, but Bernardo Arevalo sworn in as president of Guatemala on Monday. Um, Marco, when you've been on the show before, we spoke about some of the fears of uh, what could happen because uh, there were many efforts to try to delegitimize this election. Um, coup fears as well right up until monday there were a lot of uh kind of scary moments that luckily did not come to pass um before we get to the more recent events for people who maybe didn't listen to your past appearances on the program um who is bernardo arevalo why is his election so historic um and what does it represent for guatemala uh, bernardo arevalo de leon is the uh, presidential, now he's the president of Guatemala. He was the candidate of a newly, relatively newly formed political party called Semilla, which translates as seed. Uh, this party got only organized in Guatemala in 2019. And this political party emerged out of the protests in Guatemala in 2015, large scale protests against corruption, against impunity, and so on. The, the, the protests that managed to overthrow a government back then in 2015. Arevalo uh, is also a man who has spent the last 20, 30 years of his life working uh, uh, as an academic, working as a consultant, working as a diplomat for Guatemala in various capacities in various countries. But most important of all, Bernardo Arevalo is the son of Juan Jose Arevalo. Juan Jose Arevalo is important in Guatemalan history. In fact, it's important in Latin American history because he was the first uh, democratically elected president of Guatemala back in 1944. And that means exactly 80 years ago. So uh, uh, Juan Jose Arevalo was very important because he was not only the first democratically elected president of Guatemala in the 20th century, but he also was an innovator, a real reformist. He was a man who brought to the country, you know, badly needed transformations from the social security system to the first labor code of the country and so on. I mean, education, uh, social policy, social programs, and so on. Arevalo, uh, Bernardo Arevalo then is the son of this, uh, of this dearly remembered president of Guatemala, the first president of the October Revolution, the Guatemalan Spring from 44 to 54, which was eventually overthrown by the U.S. through a CIA-backed coup d'etat against President Jacobo Arbenz. So Arevalo carries a lot of weight on his shoulders. The legacy of his father, the memory of the people, democratic expectations, and obviously the massive levels of corruption and impunity against, against which his party has been fighting since 2019 as part of Congress and citizens have been fighting since 2015 as part of social movements. And th that historical weight is, is so important to understanding it, especially with the attempts to overturn, you know, his election when we're talking about the history of, of coups in Guatemala. Um, and also the fact that the U.S. seemingly did not stand in the way here, <laughs> which is uh, different than, of course, um, uh, the the history of, of what happened to his father's successor. Um, but what what led up to this moment being ho so historic in, um, in in the sense of, you know, how long has the right and corrupt interests, uh, how long have they had control of Guatemala's government? Um, and what were some of the ways that they tried to keep him uh, from taking power? Um, the extreme right, what we can call the neoliberal right in Guatemala, mixed with elements of corrupt politicians, corrupt business elites, members of the armed forces, all implicated in narco trafficking and so on. They have been in power in Guatemala since really the early 1990s. 
since the government of a, a, a man now dead, uh, whose name is Alvaro Arzu, whose son is an important leader of what Guatemalans call the Pact of the Corrupt in Congress. So the uh, elites of Guatemala, namely the Cacif, the, that's, the, that's the most important corporate syndicate in the country, they have been in power since the early 1990s. However, um, they managed to establish some kind of political stability in the country from the 1990s all the way to 2015. What happened in the 2010s in Guatemala is that you get this, this, this again, extremely right-wing government elected to office uh, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2013 or so, the government of Otto Perez Molina. And what happens with this government of Otto Perez Molina is that the levels of corruption in government, uh, uh, in, 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 in the private sector, uh, among, the, among the members of the military and so on, really exceeded everything Guatemalans were accustomed to. The levels of corruption were so excessive, so grotesque, so blatant, Guatemalans couldn't take it anymore. And Guatemalans knew about this because of the work of the UN Commission Against Impunity in the country, known as CSIG. CSIG put out a number of reports in 2014 and especially in 2015, which effectively left government corruption naked for everybody to see. When people realized what was happening in Guatemala with their money, their taxes, their government, the state, public common resources, and so on, they took to the streets in 2015. And that is where Arevalo essentially got his teeth as a politician. Well, Bernardo Arevalo had never really participated in politics as such. He'd been a diplomat, but not really a politician. In 2015, Arevalo goes to the plaza, the square, public spaces, and participates in demonstrations and so on against, well, the excess and corruption that the government of Otto Perez Molina had driven the country into. Now, 2015 was important. It was a watershed moment for Guatemalan history because it overthrew that government of Otto Perez Molina and everybody was celebrating. This is the beginning of something new. A new politician emerged seemingly out of nowhere from the outside, they call it. This was a comedian, a guy who again, had no experience doing politics in the country. His name was Jimmy Morales. He was like I'm, I cannot even begin to tell you how unbelievably incompetent this man was. He, not even as a comedian was he actually good. He was like utterly terrible as a comedian, B-rate at best. <laughs> this guy somehow manages to become president of the country in 2016. And what he does is begin a process which I have called in so many of my writings, a process of restoration. That is to say, when people were expecting change, when people were expecting something new, what, what does he begin to do? Restore the same levels of corruption and the same levels of impunity and the same levels of prosecution and persecution of the, 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 the media, activists, and so on in 2015. And so this horrific process of political restoration of corruption and impunity begins in Guatemala in 2016, and it goes all the way to 2019, when yet again, another extreme right-wing politician, which in 2012 was implicated in the massacre of prisoners within the Guatemalan prison system, because he'd been, in fact, a prison warden at the time, Jean Matei got elected in 2019 with, again, a political party that was just concocted for the moment, known as Vamos. And this political party put Jamate in power. And with Jamate, once again, levels of corruption are going to reach unbelievably unprecedented levels, like not even CSIG, the Commission Against Impunity and Corruption, had revealed in 2015. Now, these are times of pandemic. It was very difficult for, you know, for any government around the world. But for Jamate, the solution to the pandemic was very easy. He got on a, you know, a, 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 he, he, he got on television, gave a, a press conference to the country in early days of the pandemic. And he essentially told Guatemalans that the solution was very simple. You're on your own, he told everybody. Mm. You're pretty much, it's up to you. In other words, in Spanish, salvese quien pueda, you know. Save yourselves because we're not going to do anything about you. And, and indeed, the government didn't do anything for Guatemalans. 
But what they did was use the pandemic as a means to enrich themselves. One of the most grotesque corruption scandals is going to break out then, which is to say Guatemala went to Russia supposedly to purchase Russian vaccines against the pandemic. But we know that the value of the vaccines was excessively overpriced, exaggerated. Lots of money was spent on the vaccine, which took such a long time to arrive in the country. And when it arrived in the country, it didn't arrive in the quantities that were originally announced. Anyhow, it was a massive scandal, number one. Number two, just to give you two examples of scandals with the Jamate government. Um, and a, a group of investors from Ukraine, from Russia, and so on, went to Guatemala, middle of uh, uh, 2022, 20, 2021, 2022. Their idea was to expedite the process of getting a license to lease a massive piece of land uh, in, uh, along the Pacific coast in one of Guatemala's most important uh, commercial ports. They wanted to lease a piece of land, obviously, to facilitate the process of bringing commodities into and out of the country, plus who knows what else. The point is that they didn't want to go through all the hurdles. They didn't want to go through all the red tape. So what they did, reportedly by the New York Times, is essentially staff a massive amount of money in U.S. dollars, rolled it up like a cigar into a carpet, took it to the Jamate presidential residence, I remember literally this. handed it over to apparently reportedly to the president. And of course, this was denounced by one of Guatemala's special prosecutors still in, 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 in the office of the public ministry, despite the fact that Consuelo Porras, the chief of the public ministry, was already working to protect corrupt politicians. So after uh, uh, Sandoval denounced the what it became known as the red carpet scandal in Guatemala. He went into exile. He was began to be prosecuted. Charges began to be laid against him, not against Jamate. The chief of the public ministry protected him. Point is that the elites, the right wing politicians, the business elites, and so on, they've been in power in Guatemala since. Pretty much the transition to democracy in 1985. It worsened in the beginning of the 1990s, all the way to, well, pretty much 2023. The significance of Arevalo is that he stands against this long standing tradition of extreme right wing neoliberal rule, corrupt politicians, narco trafficking interests, and so on. It's the, the, the significance of this moment, really cannot be overstated so Absolutely. when guatemalans when yes. guatemalans went to you know went to the streets on january the 16th or 15th to celebrate i mean i was celebrating with them i'm sure i mean uh, it, it, everything that you have laid out for us ha ex explains just why this is, is so historic um then just tell us about the efforts to undermine the victory and how it it reached a fever pitch but he still did get and uh end up getting sworn in um i guess just after midnight is my uh is my at recollection 1 at 1 a.m um uh, uh, monday or tuesday after. or the day after because those efforts went up to the 11th hour almost literally um so uh, uh t tell us about what happened there it's incredible. It's actually a story worthy of a, of a kind of a, a, a magical realist novel from Latin America. Not even Gabriel Garcia Marquez would be able to come up with a plot like this. It's unbelievable. Oh, gosh, I remember her books. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, really, or honestly, his, I mean, it, this defies reality. Uh, this is what this is what this this is all about. But let me let me just quickly outline it for you. Um, the uh, second round of elections took place on August the 20th. That's when Arevalo won the second round of elections and was confirmed as the winner of the elections. Immediately after winning the elections, I'm talking about the very first days of September, the public ministry through the special prosecutor's office, FESI, headed by an extreme corrupt uh, judicial official known as Rafael Curruchiche, began to actually demand a review access to and a review of the election documents. I'm talking about the ballot boxes. I'm talking about the actual ballots people used to vote for candidates. They wanted to have access to all documentation on the argument, on the assumption that a fraud had been committed. Now, this is crazy stuff. 
Because if anything, if anybody had committed a fraud in Guatemala, it was not Semilla, it was not Arevalo. It had been the parties that this Fessy people, that Curruchiche, that the TSE and so on, have been defending themselves since January. But in September, what they did is unprecedented. They defied the constitution, election laws, and so on, and they went into the offices of the election tribunal in Guatemala, and they literally, over the course of two weeks, from the beginning of September to the middle of September, hold all the vo of the ballot boxes, the most important of the ballot boxes, the most important of the documents of the election process. They took him out of the control of the election tribunal, which is by constitution, the only one that can control those ballot boxes once they've been sealed or before, for that matter. And they took him away. And then from the middle of September until the early days of December, the public ministry, through Rafael Curuchiche, concocted a case against the elections, arguing that it had been, in fact, a fraud. And what's amazing is that they used the example of Donald Trump to hmm. make their case. How so? They argued th that, you know, not only had there been false signatures, dead people voting and so on, you know, classic stuff, but they also argued that the software used to tabulate the votes on election date had actually been rigged so that the elect the software used to tabulate the votes on election day had actually spewed out more votes in favor of Arevalo than the votes he had actually received. This was a complete lie, complete concoction. It never happened. But they did. They launched this case. They 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 built this essentially castle of sand, this house of cards. And once they were done doing this, in early December, they organized a press conference, which is completely out of this world. And Curruchiche, the special prosecutor named such as such by, by Consuelo Porras, the chief of the public ministry who is on the United States angle list of corrupt officials in Guatemala. So in early December, Curruchiche put on a press conference and essentially declared the elections null and cancelled because fraud had been committed and so on and so forth. This is crazy. A few days later, Congress, in the waning days of the, of, of the legislature, in the waning days, because they, they, they're supposed to wrap up also by January the 14th, so by the first end of the first week of December, Congress, following on the case of uh, the, the, the uh, special prosecutor Curuchiche, uh, lifted the immunity of the magistrates members of the high election tribunal of the country. So 108 votes were taken, more than 108 votes, of course, but 108 votes were sufficient to lift the immunity of the, uh, the election uh, authorities of Guatemala. And this is significant because if you lift the immunity of the election authorities in Guatemala, then you can prosecute them. And if you prosecute them, you can get rid of them. If you get rid of them, you can install your own. And if you mm. install your own, you can declare the entire process again, completely null. They were trying to do this. And in fact, they did this. Election uh, uh, authorities ended up going into exile, four of them. And this marks the turning point here. The U.S. acted very quickly. And this is apropos the point you were making. This is a kind of a happy right. historical coincidence. Yeah, why because did the US, they? Why did they come out on the right side of this? This is interesting. And I have a, I have a kind of conjecture about this. And the sure. conjecture is twofold. On the one hand, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's a democratic administration. I mean, in, in my view, they are wreaking havoc around the world. We know this. But in the State Department, there is also a, a handful of State Department officials who are in charge of affairs in Latin America, like Brian Nichols. And I think these people somehow are genuinely interested in the fate of democratic elections in places like Guatemala. Is this is also, not always the case. Is it also potentially as well that Arevalo is not like a, I mean, he's more center left as opposed to all out socialist? 
A hundred percent. If I ever were an all, an all out socialist or even more radical than that, or something, they would not be as enthusiastically supporting uh, him at all. Number sure. one. Number two, Arevalo has been visiting the U.S. and having meetings with U.S. State Departments from pretty much day one after his election uh, on, on August the 20th. So Arevalo has been cozying up to the U.S. and the U.S. State Department for sure. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. in the interest of the U.S. not to lose Guatemala uh, to the sphere of China, not to lose Guatemala to not to lose the Guatemalan vote in favor of Ukraine, not to use the Guatemalan vote in favor of Israel and so on. All these things are important as the question of migration is important to the US. They want to continue this collaboration around migration, narco trafficking uh, and so on. So all of these things are things that Arevalo has promised he will continue, he will enhance and he will in fact expand all of this. But there is also, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a kind of a really anti right wing discourse coming out of the state department which is frankly kind of disconcerting because you know this 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 is not the case all, all over around the world and it's rarely the case also in latin america so there's a happy coincidence of circumstances here which have to do obviously with global politics and regional politics and local politics but without that backing especially without the fact that in early december the u.s declared 300 guatemalans as engaging in corrupt activities and put them all on the angle list. And among the 300 Guatemalans that the U.S. declared as being cor involved in corruption, they included the, the 108 Congress members who voted to lift the immunity of the election authorities. Mm. This sent a strong message to Guatemala, very strong, especially to uh, the power groups, groups like the Constitutional Court the you know the 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 justice court and so on and the result of that was the con that the constitutional court declared that the election results were valid that the transition to power to Arevalo was going to take place no matter what that the election tribunal people couldn't be prosecuted anymore so they obviously didn't want to end up on the angle list and without us visas so this is what eventually enables Arevalo to uh, take power on January the 14th. Really quickly, because we have to get to our second guest in a second, but uh, what is your assessment of um, how Arevalo is going to be able to root out corruption if it's this deep, deep, deeply embedded? It's going to be a battle. It's not going to be very easy. Arevalo and his administration are not going to be doing able to do it by themselves. They are going to need they are going to need the support of social movements. They're going to need the support of collective organizations, civil society groups, indigenous movements, which, by the way, is also another important factor in it throughout this entire process. Without the support of indigenous movements, without, uh, you know, 105 days of action of led by indigenous groups, Arevalo would have not taken power on January the 14th. So the task ahead is gigantic. Uprooting uh, corruption in Guatemala is not a matter of just taking a broom to the you know state institutions and cleaning things you know things up. This is institutionalized. This is systemic. This is linked to the Guatemalan corporate elites, the Guatemalan neoliberal elites, and so on. So it's not going to be very easy. And so without uh, the support of activists, social movements, indigenous peoples civil society without a democratic articulation as i like to call it arevalo is not going to get very far well uh great news overall marco uh, thank you so much as always for your expertise uh and and for uh your your input here uh the uh, Substack is called uh, Refundacion, yeah. <laughs> um, Refundacion, yeah. Ref you should just say it instead of me. Uh, it's a Spanish language uh, Substack, and uh, you're also a professor um, in the uh, Latin American International Studies Department at uh, Glandon College, York University. Uh, Marco, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Really appreciate it, and glad you uh, brought some good news with you. My pleasure.